If Brexit was the appetizer, then the main course was deep fried Trump. I'm joined to discuss the landmark election by the Spectator's deputy editor, Freddie Gray and Douglas Murray. So Freddie, this time a year ago, very few people expected that Donald Trump would be president elect of the United States. Are we actually remembering that wrong? Were people already starting to see the signs of the victory that took a lot of the world by surprise? I think people were starting to see the signs by January. I think what really happened was there was the summer of Trump beforehand, where in August, because it's the slow news month, as everyone knows, he generated a lot of publicity with various statements, you know, calling Mexicans rapists and so on, in his first speech when he declared his candidacy. And I think everybody thought as soon as the summer's over, we'll return to normality and, you know, Jeb Bush or someone like that or Marco Rubio will emerge as the obvious candidate for the Republican Party. But that just didn't happen. And that was the most amazing thing. And was that a failure of the Republican Party, Douglas, or do you think that was actually just Trump's genius and the way in which he didn't seem like a conventional politician in a way that the other Republicans did? I mean, it's impossible to foresee any of it, I think. Uh, the assumption that most of us had made was that there would at some point be a, a gaffe so great that it would be unrecoverable. But um, as time went on throughout his run, it became harder and harder to see just what that could be. Uh, um, I remember sitting somewhere in the US the year before when the insult of John McCain occurred and it was on the front of the New York Post. I remember sitting with some friends and going, well, that's that, that's the end of Trump. And, and gradually over time, you learnt not to do that with every single thing that was outrageous he was meant to have said but 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 it just became it still one you know one sort of had that thought that at some point surely and then of course just before the election when the sort of the surprise of the, of the tape of him talking about women came out that some people still thought well, well that one might or must have done it and then that didn't either so it's an interesting point actually just about the the expectation that there would be a gaffe or a moment that would finish off Trump. And I have to confess that when I heard about the tape, about Trump boasting, about sexually assaulting women, I thought, oh, this must be it. Surely, surely this is the point at which the electorate turn away from him. Is this a lesson uh, amongst all the many other lessons for politicians more generally, mostly that they're wrong and they don't understand their voters anymore, that actually they don't need to worry about slipping up in the way that they've become obsessed with over the past few decades, not just in terms mm. of spin, but in terms of really couching their language really carefully and becoming very boring. Well, I, th I think it's it's worse or, or better from a news point of view than that, in that slipping up is actually, it was valuable to Trump because it, it just meant that he was always in the news and, and Clinton couldn't actually get a position, a media position. And, and in, in some way that helped her because in fact, the more people saw of Hillary Clinton, the more they were put off. But Trump was able to just completely blow up the media every week. Mm. And he's carrying on doing that. I mean, I think eventually we're going to get to an exhaustion point with his Twitter account and people are going to say, OK, we know what's happening here. He's going to do a massive stream of tweets and it'll all go and, and, and people finally get tired of of sort of Trump's madness. And not just on social media. Do you think that Trump is having to tone down his, the way he approaches well, other politicians, we've seen some of the readouts of phone calls that he's had, had since being elected, Douglas. My particular favourite was the call to Pakistan, in which he, yeah. he just talked about everyone being wonderful and getting on really well, which I thought was an interesting reading of the situation. Yes, my, my favourite was the discussion with Viktor Orban, uh, when Orban described himself as being something of a black sheep in Washington, and Trump said, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, just just to quickly on, on this issue, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting one, uh, 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 certainly in Britain, but in America increasingly in recent years, yes, any public appearance by a politician has had very little benefit potential, but a huge risk. Uh, you can see it in the eyes of British politicians when they appear on television. You know, they might say something wrong about what we think about rape now or women or gays or, or something else. And and you can see it in their eyes that the aim is to just get through without that. The sort of Danny Alexander technique. Absolutely. Bore the public into submission and or at least to you know turning off. And I think that the important thing to remember about Trump, though, is it isn't quite what uh, I mean, both of you have said something I would pick up on here. It isn't quite what it, it has it has been reported as. So, for instance, Freddie said that, that Mexicans are rapists. And of course, the actual some, yeah. comment, no, no, of course. Yeah. the actual comment was clearly that some of the Mexicans are rapists, and then, of course, and I'm sure some of them are very nice people. The whole tone and context of it, of course, you know, we all know if we listen to it, we know he's joking about something. He's also kind of nasty, but it's 
it's it's within a parameter which after he said it it was immediately put outside of yes and every single thing he did ended That's up encountering that and this is a really interesting element of this election as well isn't it that obviously in every election there are smears and misquotes from the other side mm. but one of the words that we hadn't really heard at the start of this year was fake news which has now become a big phenomenon yes freddie well, I think that Trump very much thrives in, in, in this sort of supposedly fake news environment. What he does a lot, as Douglas says, is a sort of bait and switch. I mean, I think the interesting thing about Trump is actually if you really analyse him, he's fundamentally quite politically correct because he will always say something incorrect with a sort of correct hedge. Um, mm. And actually what you'll see is that, you know, people will say, oh, that's outrageous. And then they'll read the quote and they'll think, oh, well, he did say some or, you know, oh, he, was, he wasn't just talking about the Mexican judge's parents being evil because they were... Hispanic. And so it, it's, it's the relief from the initial shock that makes people warm to him. But how does a, I'm not quite sure what word to use, normal, sensible, run of the mill politician respond to Trump in, in terms of the way they behave as a politician? You can't be another Pack up Trump. Their bags and go home. Well, th there is that. <laughs> but if you want to beat Trump, if, if you want to be the next president of the United States to stop Trump having two terms, if, if that's possible, mm. what, what do you do? You can't out Trump Trump, but you can't be boring. You can't be Hillary Clinton. Well, you could be, of course, couldn't you next time round? I mean, you could be boring. You could probably better if you weren't Hillary Clinton. But I would have thought the obvious thing is to watch what he actually does. We've spent such a long time talking about what Trump says and what it might hint about him or tell us about him. And, so, and now we're in a totally different period where we're going to have to see what he does. Do the American people indeed become tired of winning? Do they become bored of it? Or do they discover that having been overpromised by another candidate, that it doesn't work out like that. And and if so, then his opponents will not be talking about which words he used. They will not be talking about whether or not he said you can sexually assault a woman or whether he said you can grab them with their consent because they like you or celebrity. They'll be talking about the impact of his policies on Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan. And they'll be seeing whether or not he has improved relations with Moscow in a decent way or, or, or not or an embarrassing way for Washington. So that's what we'll end up being able to discuss with Trump. And I, for one, think it'll be a huge relief. It'll be about facts. And what sort of facts are you expecting, Douglas? Are you expecting America to become isolationist to, to, or to develop stronger alliances with Russia? What, what do you... I, I don't not, want you to make too many predictions, no, but... <laughs> I won't make any predictions, but um, I think people will be surprised. And I think that anyone who thinks that, that the isolationism, for instance, is obvious, is, has not paid attention either to his appointments or indeed to previous presidents. Also, all of us who remember anyone, you know, of any American president, remembers the fact that they run as one thing and then when they're in office, something else happens. I remember George W. Bush running as a, actually rather more isolationist than Donald Trump in many ways. W. Bush certainly didn't talk about, you know, which things he'd really like to intervene in and really sort out, you know. Um, so he ran as a vaguely isolationist candidate, but within a year of coming into office was quite the opposite. It was state building, nation building or trying to all over the place so and, and and it'll be the same with trump do, do you agree with that freddie that the appointments and some of the the statements that trump has made since being elected contradict some of his campaign strategy well i, th I think douglas is right to say that it's refreshing that there were there could be a real focus on what trump actually does eventually because what he says will become tiresome i suppose that the the, the real facts about trump might start to become more clear and that's and that's the mystery is that is he going to become a, a sort of kleptocrat is he going to try and keep his businesses going and use government to make his businesses more profitable i mean that will be what the left lefty press obsesses over and they perhaps they will find legitimate stuff and will people care that's another mm. good question he'd be a great fool if, if he did uh, allow any of that to invade onto it he must know that's his big vulnerability in the short term yes but i think uh, i mean i think the, the evidence suggests he's very incapable of thinking about anything other than business business is is, is is the person who he is and so he's not really a politician in any way so it will be interesting to see that i don't i'm not saying that he will become a kleptocrat i think that will be the the big focus of obsession of the left and they may well find plenty of evidence. And in terms of two of the totemic domestic policies that were discussed during the election, Obamacare and the wall, what have we heard since about those two issues? Definitely that toning down. Yeah, definitely. Yes, it's a toning down on both of them, obviously. I mean, uh, he's going to have to become used to saying, you know, that's something I said on the campaign. Can you get away with that? 
Or does he have the same punishments that other politicians get for, for, for um, this sort of thing? In the long term, I mean, on both those things, unless he can get the immigration uh, thing at least better than it currently is, and unless he can come up with some kind of viable alternative to Obamacare, then they will punish him. I mean, you know, he spent a lot of time being a destroyer and now he's got to be a builder, whether of a wall or anything else, we don't know. But he, he's got to build up policies and, and, and then we'll judge him on that. But it is quite, as I say, the, the, the real thing is that if at the end of four years, the Trump supporters have the same sense of letdown that Obama supporters did after it turned out he didn't, you know, stop the oceans rising and all that, then we will just see one of the most disappointed democratic nations in the world. Freddie, what would smart Democrats do now over the next year, next four years? I think they'd recognise the fact that they lost on class grounds. They, they were so obsessed with race and gender for a long time and they ignored the fact that their, their core vote, the, the working class or lower middle class in states in the Rust Belt and so on, had completely deserted them. Not just the, you know, the, the dribs and drabs we saw in Reagan and Bush, but completely deserted mm. them. And, and they are no longer the party of the poor in America. And, and now you have this extraordinary situation of Trump being the representative of the poor in America. So the Democrats, I think, will learn that, you know, Bernie Sanders probably would have been a better candidate than Hillary Clinton. Would he have won? I don't know. I tend to think yes, but lots of people who know much more about this than me say no. So I, I think they will, if they're smart, they'll recognise that they've got to stop this identity politics and focus on being a party that betters the economic interests of the poor. And Douglas, if Republicans are as dismayed by Trump in office as they claimed they would be during the campaign, what can they do to rebuild their party? I mean, at the start of this year, we were talking very much about the collapse of the Republican yes. Party. And what do they also do to deal with another group that we haven't really heard much about until the election, which is the alt-right? Just tell us a bit <laughs> about that. Well, the obvious th thing would be, uh, on the first thing, I, I don't think the Republican Party has that much rebuilding to do. I mean, it's done terribly well. As you say, I mean, it's one of the oddities of, of politics, certainly the last year, that we talk about the collapse of one thing and the other thing collapses instead. And I, I, I wouldn't be confident to say, you know, how they sort the party out. They, they've obviously got to keep some distance between the, the president, the president-elect at the moment, and, and, the, and the party, and that's going to be a natural divide. As for the, um, the so-called alt-right, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't the sort of Philip Blonde, as it were, of this, um, of this period. <laughs> what I, I thought. I don't wish to insult Philip Blonde, but I mean, in the, you know, at the beginning of Cameronism, there was that sort of thing that, oh, this, this is the thing that's most connected with it. And uh, these things are very amorphous, uh, influential ideas, intellectual ideas, input from various they all sort of fall away after a bit because just the business of governing happens no, we're not so going to be saying talking... milo's just a fad no no, no i'm <laughs> look in in two years time i'd be very surprised if we were talking about the alt-right nobody can quite put their finger on what the alt-right is it's a very interesting sort of morphous it's obviously a movement it's obviously a sort of response it's obviously a thing but people can't find out very much about it because it isn't much it, it's not we can't put our finger on what it is intellectually because it isn't an intellectual movement with within yes. Whereas Philip Blonde, well, you know, was an intellectual movement. In yes, a way. I, you may not have. I crucially it. do not want yeah. to say that I'm sort of insulting Philip Blonde, on this. <laughs> but it's just that it's just that these 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 ideas that people are bound to intellectual movements is sometimes a mistake. But the obvious thing would be, if I may say so, with the so-called alt right, is to actually identify the press in particular have a duty to find out honestly what it is honestly what the people involved with it are saying not to say that they're all nazis unless they are all nazis and and to actually you know do investigative journalism on it and then the job for trump would be to see if he can do with them uh, what republicans in the past did for instance with the john birch society are they able to make very clear blue water are they able to to make it so clear these are not their people that actually the alt-right or you know whatever are useful to trump well mm. you know i I'm, you say I'm uh, this far out there, wacky, crazy guy. You should see who's who's beyond me. But as I say, I, I, I for one would really like it if people in the coming months just looked at the origins and the truth about political movements instead of just continually using them as as a way to win. You know, those guys are Nazis, uh, anti-women, uh, pro-rape, uh, racist, so and so. Hear me roar, I'm great. And that's sort of been the limit of it so far. That was Freddie Gray and Douglas Murray.